Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we're talking more NFL draft, this time with Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus, getting his thoughts on the number three pick and other things re- regarding the NFL draft and betting it for this year. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work Over at thepowerrank.com, and Ed, I'm glad that we're talking today because I know nothing about soccer, and there was this whole (laughs) Super League discussion this week. I had to text my high school friend who knows soccer, and like I had to send the Michael Michael Scott gif of, explain this to me like I'm five years old. Luckily, I've got you, Ed. Explain to me what the heck this, this Super League thing is, please, for a layman. So, so first of all, let's talk about European soccer, right? Right now, each, all the top clubs in a country play in their own league, right? So the Premier League in Britain, the Bundesliga in Germany. And then there's a European-wide competition called Champions League that puts the best of those leagues, and you have to qualify in order to make it to Champions League. So the Super League was this idea that some of the top clubs were going to make Um, instead of doing the Champions League, they were going to still play in the Domestic League, but instead of Champions League, they were going to form this own Super League where they would play midweek. Um, I think it was either... The idea was there would be 20 teams and 15 of them would be permanent members. So they couldn't be relegated out of the league. And the response was really interesting to me because the biggest argument against this was that it was a big money grab, to which I say, yes, you're absolutely right. It is a big money grab. But you have to think, like, why is it a big money grab? And um, it, it is because a lot of people would watch. It would be some incredible soccer every week watching these top clubs play against each other. And it's interesting from my perspective because I feel like I'm just this capitalist pig that's the only person <laughs> in America or the entire world that actually thought this was a good idea. I thought this would be great soccer, and I think it would have generated more interest uh, from everyone in watching more European soccer. Uh, it's something that I really enjoy watching, but I don't really get much time to do it. And when more people are watching European soccer, they're going to want to bet on it. So it would have been really a boom for, for sports betting as well. Everything kind of fell apart when the, the people on, uh, in Great Britain decided they uniformly hated this. Um, and, and it kind of fell apart. So it was like, it was kind of an incredible 48 hours. Um, but, I just think, you know, the sports is not about fans, right? Sports yeah. is a business. Yeah. And it, it's kind of interesting for me to think about how much of a capitalist pig I am. <laughs> I actually really don't think I am in real life. But, right. but <laughs> this, the same thing could happen in college football, right? Okay. So there's, been a, there's been a ton of articles this week. It's, it's the same idea. Michigan, Ohio State, Oregon, USC, the top 16 teams form a Super League. Uh, at the exclusion of, of all other teams. And that would be different because that would kind of, you know, they would they would actually have to leave their conferences right. because they're not going to play that many extra games. Um, I mean, the media rights would be incredible, oh right? I mean, they would they would be sickening how big those Well, if you make the, the college football playoff be every week, yes. It would be sickening numbers, basically. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you hear people say like, oh, I don't want to play good teams every week. You know, like some of these soccer fans are like, but you watch the NFL. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, so, so yeah, it was, it, it's been interesting for me to, to think about. And, and, I, and I'm, yeah, so. See, this is the perspective of someone who roots for a bad team. This is me. I'm thinking, huh, I can get rid of Ohio State and Michigan, open things up a little bit in the Big Ten. Uh, oh, me get rid Northwestern. of Penn State, too. Yeah, yeah, yep. okay, we'll get rid of them. Um, honestly, get rid of everyone else who's good. And if we just make it like Northwestern, Illinois, Rutgers, like, cool. Sign me up. Iowa, yeah. Uh, Iowa's good. I I don't know if I want to keep Iowa. You could probably take Iowa. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like, we need to set the bar real low here, Ed. If Northwestern, (laughs) like, if they they do what UEFA or whatever it was saying, like, okay, we're going to ban you, and we ban all those other teams. Like, if we can ban the, those other ones and make it just be Northwestern <laughs> versus Rutgers, sick. Sign me up. If Northwestern's ever going to win a national championship, it's probably going to have to be as a result of this college football <laughs> Super League. I'm desperate, Ed. 
I'm not opposed. <laughs> Like, I would go yeah. to great depths. I, I think that's an interesting perspective from you. Um, yeah, it would it would be easier. I mean, let, let's be, let it be noted that Northwestern has won a Big Ten West championship within the last two years. Twice. Well, yeah, they've won two Big Ten West championships within right. the past so couple of years. It's, it's, not, it's not, you know, it's not. But a, they were never going to win the championship game because they were going to get just run through sure i'd like to not have that part happen at least at least you made it to the championship game true all those other teams had zero probability of winning winning that championship game until Uh, we ban michigan and ohio state and we make it northwestern versus Rutgers 15 times per year they just play scrimmages against each other i'm i'm in man let's let's sign me up so just a couple of thoughts about that. Like the idea that UEFA is going to ban these top clubs from their yeah. competition is a joke. They yeah. need those top clubs. That right. That's completely not happening. And uh, as much as I kind of like these Super League ideas, like the thing in America would be that that would probably destroy the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Um, because of the, the structure of, 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 you know, those those big programs kind of leaving the NCAA. And well, may, I mean, maybe there's a way they can fix it. That maybe there's a way they can just make football <laughs> leave and then everything else could stay the same so anyways i thought it was a great i thought it was a great 48 hours of drama i mean like it's fun to think about even if it will ever happen it is fun to think about the well, idea of having alabama ohio state on a random saturday i, I mean are you sure it's not going to happen I, i'm sure there's somebody I mean, at google thinking about how many billions of dollars they can throw at that right now oh my goodness yeah the streaming wars heating up by totally disbanding college football conferences that is next level i love it. i mean someone someone at amazon and google are thinking about this that that yeah. is for sure. and they'll drop 16 billion dollars on the media rights deal and it'll be like one 190th of their annual income and it'll be just fine we're gonna talk about the actual college football guys coming into this year's nfl draft with dr eric eager of pro football focus he is a data scientist over there one of the hosts of the pff forecast podcast we're gonna talk to him about betting on the nfl draft trying to balance your own evaluation of these players with what you're reading from a reporting perspective and how that leads to edges in betting. We'll talk with uh, Dr. Eric Eager about that in just a little bit. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Kentucky Derby podcast coming up next week. We're going to talk about that. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed for that to get it right as it goes up and all of our other stuff here on Covering the Spread. And if you like what you hear or if you win some money based on the bets, make sure you leave us a rating and review you as well. What's going on, sports fans? FanDuel Sportsbook has a special offer for you this spring season. Same game parlays allow viewers to bet on any NBA, MLB, or soccer game. Place a four-plus leg parlay on any game across those three sports, and if exactly one leg loses, you will receive a refund credit on the site up to $25. Come get involved in the action and place a same-game parlay on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21-plus and present in, New- in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Refund issued as a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $25. Terms apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, call 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, call 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line 1-800-889-9789. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's bring on Dr. Eric Eager now. Find his work over at ProFootballFocusPFF.com and also on the PFF Forecast Podcast and get his thoughts on the number three overall pick in this year's draft and betting the draft for 2021. Covering the present. Let's bring Dr. Eric Eager into covering the spread to talk about this year's NFL draft. And I've been listening to you guys a lot over on the PFF Forecast podcast. So I feel like I know a lot of your thinking, which is refreshing. It's been fun to listen to. uh, And I appreciate the info. How are things going for you, Eric, so far? Things are going well. Uh, It's fun to talk to you guys again. Um, We haven't had games in a while other than FCS, which I think would take a true, true degenerate to bet. Um, but yeah, the draft has been, uh, you know, really fun sort of whirlwind of trying to understand what the markets mean and, and sort of where, uh, everybody's thinking. Have you gotten down in the depths enough to actually bet FCS yet or, uh, not quite there? I I have a little bit. Um, we, we've been collecting data. This is like the first year we've collected all of FCS. Uh, and I, and I think that, 
that'll end up being the the reality moving forward here, which is yeah. interesting, and just sort of see, um, you know, and watch some games on the weekends. Uh, you know, now that uh, soccer started again and, and stuff, well, I might not watch quite as much. Um, but it's it's been okay. It's been a nice diversion a little bit. So uh, when you had Trey Lance back in 2019, when he was uh, at North Dakota State, would Pro Football Focus specifically watch just those games in order to get like the top end pro? Because it wasn't just him. Was that just to get him, or have you always had FCS data just expanding it this year? Yeah, that's a great question. Usually, what we'll do is we will take on requests from uh, NFL teams to yeah. to uh, you know basically collect certain conferences. So. Um, for example, there was one year where we collected, um, you know, for Dallas Goddard, uh, there was one year we collected for Trey Lance, um, the, the, the Kyle Duggar who played for Lenore Ryan. We collected his conference that year. Um, we've never collected all of FCS at once, but we will collect for players who are, are considered, you know, highly like, uh, Ben Barch last year was, uh, from St. Thomas or yeah, no St. John's, uh, a Minnesota, uh, division three school. We, we collected all of the Mayak that year. Um, just so we could give uh, you know our team clients the the data. Nice. It's uh, nice to have that. Next, looking forward to next year too. Should be a lot of fun. But I just want to talk to you about this draft betting process in general. Do you feel like you've had more interest this year? Because I feel like last year was unique in that there was nothing else going on. So we had our ability to dump all of our energy and our focus into the draft. Have you felt that carrying over into this year as well? If you feel like an increased interest on from you personally. Well, I think for me personally, for sure, I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, we, we, my, my colleague George and I do the, you know, the analytics mock where we use our projections, but I've also dived in a little bit more into, I would call the, the market implied mock, which is looking at sort of how the markets would pick, um, you know, and the, the interesting thing I've noticed from this year, and I, you guys are probably um, very privy to this as well, is last season there were a lot more markets available and a lot more markets available early i think this year i mean you guys led the way a little bit at FanDuel. uh DraftKings um opened up i think it was mac jones 18 and a half that was like the only over under that they had on the site for about a month there um and you know some other places bet online you know uh you know uh, off offshores and things like that like there were there was not necessarily as many outs available to people who wanted to bet the draft as last year, which makes sense. I mean, because there was nothing to bet on last year except for like Madden Sims uh, and, and you know Brady versus Peyton Manning golf. So like, the, I, I get that, but that that was kind of interesting in terms of forming opinions. Like you really didn't have the the richness of the marketplace, um, you know, a month ago that you do today. Is that tough too? Because with the markets opening up now, we've had more time to collect data, which means you're not going to find as many inefficiencies. Has that, that that been difficult trying to spot those inefficiencies when there are just fewer spots to find them? Yeah, I, well, I think that the you know the books that that hang lines up there that aren't copying other books, like obviously they're taking a risk. The longer right. that they wait to get into the marketplace, the the more that the consensus has been pounded into place. Now, you know, all these books, I think, with with props like this, have lower limits, so there's still going to be inefficiencies. I mean, for example, today when the when Mac Jones eclipsed Justin Fields as the as the favorite to be the third pick, there was another, you know, on DraftKings, there was another book that sort of had it flipped. So you could have had an arbitrage opportunity for a for a small amount of time, um, you know, limits notwithstanding. So there it is like less efficient, um, but it's obviously as we approach the draft and things, you know, sort of coalesce, they'll become, you know, you know, less and less of more and more efficient, less and less opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, having those markets open for like a month earlier last year, I, I think just drove us to that consensus more quickly. So Eric, I'm really excited to talk to you about the NFL draft. Uh, Chris Andrews uh, was on VEASAN this week talking about how they've never made a dollar uh, putting up this market, which, which gets me kind of excited about things. Yes. What, uh, are you parsing through reporting? Are you doing analytics or what, what are the tools? Are you just listening to people in the league? Well, there, there are a lot of great resources. I mean, Benjamin Robinson, as you guys know, does the grinding, the mocks. That's a great tool. Arif Hassan with the athletic does a great, great job with his consensus board. We have contacts within the league now, you know, they're tight lipped, but you can sort of get an idea of, you know, from what people are asking us and things like that. Um, and a lot of it is just, you know, we also have our mock draft simulator, which by the way, made it to NFL.com this week, where you can parse through that data and see what fans are doing. Um, and again, like the wisdom of the crowds is really an effective tool. And, you know, as long as there are enough independent uh, pieces of information, I think that that information is extremely valuable. 
Um, and, and again, just following the markets. Like, you know, we had an idea that Zach Wilson, my, my betting partner and I, you know, betted at minus 167 that he would be the second overall pick. Now it's, you know, now it's trending towards, you know, minus 5,000. You can almost assume that that's a lock, but there are other situations as we'll talk about with Justin Fields, Mac Jones, uh, and Trey Lance with that third pick, uh, you know, I think is anyone's guess at this point. And then you're, you're sort of looking and you're sort of logically going through it and saying, well, if this is the number for Justin Fields, what does that imply? Um, you know, what would my intuition and prior say, okay, does that make that a good bet or not? Um, that's kind of where, where it's going and sort of thinking through, you know, what teams need, what teams have done historically, all those things are, I think, valuable once you sort of get a baseline prior set from the, the marketplace itself. Now, I do want to talk Mac Jones, but I also, you mentioned Zach Wilson. I think that's an interesting point here because I know Pro Football Focus has Zach Wilson very high in their player rankings for this year. Did that inform your decision to take Zach Wilson at number two overall, or was it kind of reading the tea leaves in the reporting, or was it the the confidence you had based on your numbers at PFF? Uh, all the above. I mean, for me, you know, I wrote a piece about just or about uh, Zach Wilson right during his bowl game uh, against UCF. And, you know, it was one of those where it, uh, with, with respect to Justin Fields, I thought Fields is that, uh, you know, statistical profile going into 2020 was a little bit better than Trevor Lawrence's. And, you know, even though he had a, a long haul to go to overcome the prior that we all had that Lawrence was going to be the first pick two years after he beat Alabama in the in the in the title game. Um, you know, what ended up happening was that Zach Wilson, even after you adjusted for the week schedule that BYU had, after you adjusted for kind of the week supporting cast that BYU gave him and the circumstances, he ended up having like literally the best statistical profile in the whole class. And so even though I think it was it, he still didn't eclipse what we needed to see to have him overcome Lawrence, right. And the prior that we had on him and the, you know, the, some of the things he had to overcome and he was kind of graded on a curve because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. I, it was a fairly solid move for me to say, well, he's probably the, has the potential to be the most special quarterback in this class. And as such, like he's probably the number two pick um, if you add it all up. And then the question is, is how close is fields? to him uh, when you look at two versus three or, you know, one A, one B, and one C. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's get on to my, Mac Jones. Um, so, you know, you the, the third pick is going to be kind of a coin flip. Um, you know, you, you've written about how you like Justin Fields there. Uh, right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook, Mac Jones has jumped back in the lead at minus 125. Justin Fields is plus 130. Trey Lance is uh, plus 290. Uh, break this down for us. Yeah, I mean, so th this is how interesting, and you guys know this, having you know, producing betting content. I, I start my article when it's two fifty, and then by the time <laughs> I, I file it, it's one seventy five. And you know, I still think one seventy five is a good bet. Um, obviously, two fifty. You know, my my logic was always, you know, two fifty is a you know thirty percent break even. If you assume Lance Fields and um, uh, and uh, Mac Jones are all equally likely to be the third pick. Well, that's a 33%, and you have a 3% edge on that. Um, if you if you assume that Lance is a little bit weaker than both of them, then that edge grows. Um, and if you, you know, again, and if you even if you assume that that Mac Jones has a little bit of a lead, it's 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 going to require quite a bit. Uh, to overcome, you know, the 250 as as being a negative EV bet. So that that was kind of my my logic now. And as I said on the PFF forecast this this week, now, you know, when w once those guys start getting into that plus 125 to minus 125 range, I, I'm probably not betting it just because, like, I do think anything could happen there. And even though I wouldn't trade three first round picks for Mac Jones, with with respect to the draft, you can't coach your bet. I mean, you you have to bet what you think is going to happen. Um, and, you know, it's very likely it was, there, there's a very good chance that the 49ers do something that we don't necessarily agree with. Right. And, and what's how, it like for you? Because you've had this field's position for a while now and you're seeing people like Adam Schefter, Daniel Jeremiah, who are super plugged in talking about Mac Jones. How does like how does that factor into things for you when you're looking at that bet you already have in hand? Are you like. I don't want to say like regret because I think obviously we've seen good movement. It's hard to regret when you get great movement, but what were your feelings on that? Once you saw those plugged in people talking about the pick the way they were. 
Well, I mean, I think you have to respect the information. You also, I think you have to weigh the information by history and sort of with, with respect to the 49ers, you've, you've seen, you know, John Lynch get hired without much of a peep at all. And in fact, I believe the, the report was that he was testing whether or not they could keep the information in house uh, before he would take the job. Um, you know, the Garoppolo trade happened without much of a lead up. The Buckner trade happened without much of a lead up. And then this past trade um, with uh, the uh, Miami Dolphins happened without much of a lead up. So in my opinion, I don't know if this would be the, the time where we're really going to say, well, you know, back then was different. Now is now is what we're really, you know, back then was different. Now the, the 49ers are a leaky franchise. Like, I just don't see that happening. So again, that like pushes me back, not, not necessarily away from Mac Jones, like the opposite of what they're reporting, but just back towards the prior of possibly even outcomes for all those, all those picks, maybe Lance a little lower given, you know, sort of his pedigree having just one season starting in FCS. But when you look at Fields and Mac Jones, like if you view them as equally likely to be the pick, then, then, you know, that, that you're still sitting on a really good number at plus 250, even out to like, I would say plus 150, you know, might have value. Um, and again, I'm not disregarding the information. I think the information you know, sort of gives credence to the idea that Jones could go at three, which none of us were considering. But I don't think it pushes him out to the 305 favorite that he was just about a week and a half ago. Yeah, for sure. Let's go on to the pass catchers in this draft. We have Kyle Pitts and Jamar Chase uh, that have over-unders at five and a half and uh, Devonta Smith and Jalen Waddell, the two Alabama guys at 11 and a half. How do you stack these guys up and do you see any value? Yeah, I mean, Chase was always considered to be the best from the beginning. Um, there were numbers available for him. Like, I think he was even even with uh, Smith when the thing when the whole thing started. It was like maybe plus one twenty five each guy or or something like that. And I, I got it on the way up at minus one forty one forty nine or something like that. Um, and now, obviously, I don't think there's any value in betting him. I think on FanDuel it's minus nine hundred or so, minus nine twenty five. You know. At that point, you're you're sort of you can sprinkle some, I think, on Jalen Waddle. The the thing, um, you know, as I talk to people within the league, like Devontae Smith is a great football player, but I think and played the best of all of them in college. But um, you know, there are people within the league, and maybe they don't matter vis a vis the the first wide receiver taken, but they probably matter as far as the second wide receiver taken, who think Jalen Waddle's the better of the two players and the best wide receiver uh, in that class. So to me, and, and the, these numbers have moved, I think, since we talked about it on the forecast, but if you can look at and you can find a market where you're looking at Waddle versus Smith, I think Waddle's the pick there, um, and, and maybe even Smith on an over 11 and a half draft position prop. I, I think those are all you know, when you're looking at the wide receiver marketplace, in addition to, you know, and this number's moved as well, over four and a half wide receivers taken in round one, uh, I think those are great value. Yeah, Devontae Smith was initially minus 140, I believe, to go under 11 and a half. It's now minus 110. So it does seem like sentiment drifting away from Devontae Smith and potentially toward Jalen Waddle as well. The under for him is actually now minus 122 on 11 and a half. So FanDuel as well viewing Jalen Waddle ahead of Devontae Smith. He mentioned Jamar Chase, the prohibitive favorite to be the first wide receiver taken. But there are some, you know, other positions where... We could get them at, at, you know, the favorites at lower numbers, potentially. Anyone standing out to you as being the first uh, p- person drafted their position as being undervalued right now? Yep, and this is one um, you guys, I think, have the best number at, at FanDuel. Um, I like Javante Williams at 5-1 to one to be the first running back. Uh, I know that has opened, and, you know, some of us got it at 7. I think it went all the way down to 3-1 to one for a while. And now, you know, Najee Harris, I think, is is growing as the favorite there. Um, but there are some issues with with him as the first running back. For one, running back is just that position where some team randomly takes Clyde edwards helaire in the back half of the first round. Or some team, you know, the, the 2018 draft, Barkley went first, which was a lock. But then, you know, the next running back taken were, were guys that people didn't like, like Sony Michelle and uh, Rashad Penny, were, which were worse players than Nick Chubb. So, like... You know, the you know, the the fact is, is like I think a running back gets taken in round one and I think it surprises us a little bit. And Williams is, I, I think, the best running back in the in the class. Um, so I like him there. I You know, the, the other one uh, and this is this is, you know, I, this number I can I've seen it anywhere from eight to one. And you guys have it at five to one at FanDuel. Christian Barmore being the first defensive lineman taken. 
this is where you can exploit the fact that defensive lineman includes more than one position because you know Quiddy pays the favorite. Um, you know, Jalen Phillips, I think, is, is closely behind. Both those guys benefited from Gregory Rousseau doing terribly. You know, the previous favorite, Gregory Rousseau doing terribly um, in his uh, you know, workout. But if a team is going to prefer an interior defensive lineman over an edge player, Barmore is the only guy in that class worthy of a first-round pick. And so he could rant if one of those edges falls or both of the edges fall and a team prefers an interior defensive lineman, you get a nice, you know, five-to-one pop there uh, if you go with Barmore. And it's also interesting, too, because, like, we have not seen NFL teams go away from interior guys. Like, Quinn Williams, uh, we saw Derek Brown. So there are still NFL teams that are looking for that. I think that that lends itself to what you were talking about, where there are still teams that will value that over an edge guy. Yeah, the, and the edge class is about as bad. You know, last year wasn't great other than Chase Young, but this year it's about as bad, and they don't even have a top-end guy like a Chase Young. So. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you even go back to like Christian Wilkins was a thir- you know thirteenth by Miami. Uh, you know, teams will take defensive linemen on the on the interior. You know, uh, uh, the guy uh, Javon Kinlaw was taken, I believe, fourteenth last year by San Francisco. Teams value that position, and I think you know there's some statistical evidence that if you get one of those big guys, um, you know, it does help you in coverage weirdly because you can play uh, more players deep. Uh, because a guy can, you know, eat up more blockers. So th- there is some validity to being to taking those guys. And if it's the only one, and we'll talk about Kyle Pitts, I think, if it's the only guy worthy of a first round pick, that adds to their value due to scarcity. Yeah, interesting. So uh, you can also look at how many players at each position are going to go in the first round uh, over at Fanduel. Are there any numbers there that that stand out to you? Yeah, you guys have, I think, the the best price here, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So running back over a half is minus two twenty five. I think, you know, Pittsburgh's a clear one there. I think you're even hearing Buffalo, who that would surprise me given how smart they can be. Um, but you're hearing Buffalo, you know, talk about taking a running back high. Um, Tampa Bay could be another one, although they just got Giovanni Bernard. Um, I, I, you know, I've seen this other places at minus three hundred, minus three twenty five. Um, but if you can get that, you know, at 220, 225 or less, I think that's a pretty good one. Wide receiver, the market has moved drastically. So I think I got over four and a half wide receivers at minus 160. Uh, you know, it's my anywhere from minus 200 to minus 310 now. Uh, I think that price is actually pretty fair. If you look at you know, the top three guys and then you have Rashad Bateman, all you need is one of Terrence Marshall, Elijah Moore, uh, Kadarius Tony or Rondell Moore to get over that number, and that seems pretty fair to me. Um, the last one that I that I do like um, is over six and a half offensive linemen. Um, you were able to get a plus, you know, that opened at minus one fifty, and it dra- it went to about plus one ten. Now it's minus one eighteen. I think minus one eighteen uh, is still a, a bettable number there. Yeah, six and a half is a big number historically for offensive linemen, but when over it last year, it sounds like the sentiment around this year's class is similar. The testing numbers for a lot of these guys has been very good. I mean, shocker, you know, they're all pro days. Like, and you wrote a piece about pro days versus the combine and stuff like that, but um, it, it does make sense. And actually, while we have you here, I did want to ask you about Panay Sewell because and we've got him, Jamar Chase up there, Kyle Pitts, all in conversation for those fourth and fifth picks. I mean, like, I, I'm, I don't want to ask you for betting stuff because I didn't ask you to prepare stuff like this. But, like, if you're the Bengals at five, what are you doing there? Are you going with Suell? Are you going with Jamar Chase? Kyle Pitts, if he's there? How do you view that from their perspective? Uh, that's a tremendous question because I think it changed. Like, so if I'm the Bengals, I have Riley Reef, I have Jonah Williams, a player I, I invested a top 15 pick in, but who hasn't played much more than 10 games in two years. Um, my quarterback is just coming off an ACL, has not proven himself yet to be a, like a. Mo- and I had this conversation actually with somebody who he asked me this very question. And I said, if you have a Mahomes, I would take Chase or Pitts because my quarterback can mi- my quarterback can do fine with a second round lineman, and a and the first round receiver offers such a great benefit. But you know, let's assume Pitts is off the board at four. <laughs> Um, I would take Sewell over Chase if I was Cincinnati because I think I can get a receiver in the top half of the second round that can complement T. Higgins as, as well as uh, Tyler Boyd um, better than I can get an offensive lineman there that would help me protect Burrow if if my three receivers were Chase, 
um, you know, Chase Higgins and, and and Tyler Boyd. That that is a little bit like that's a variance versus mean argument. Like I think the mean outcome for wide receiver is probably higher, but the variance is higher too. And and right now with Burrow, you already have two really pretty good receivers. If, if you decrease the variance associated with injury risk and all that kind of stuff by going with Sewell, uh, I, I think that that's where you want to go. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense for sure. Any other bets standing out to you based on where the current market or markets are currently at? It could be any book uh, based on wherever you see the best number. Where are you seeing value still lingering here with one week left? Oh, that's that's a great that's a great question. I you know right now, um, oh man, uh, and now you have, you know the, the one that the one that might be a nice, uh, it's. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go. Like, I think. I think Trey Lance under six and a half draft position is is where to go. The the thing that the the that people sort of. I don't know if they really saw this coming, but when Miami went from three to twelve to six, I think everybody looked at them at that six position and said, "Well, they're gonna get the best of Pitt, Sewell, or Chase there, and that's why that pick is so valuable." Whereas when I see it, I think to myself, "Okay." They're going to have that because the Bengals are sort of locked in. They're sort of old school. They're not trading the pick. They're going to probably take Sewell or Chase there. If 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 I look at it, I say, well, they're going to dangle that pick over Denver's head. Denver having a bunch of young players on on rookie deals in the skill position spots. If it goes, you know, if if, if Fields lands there or Lance lands there, they're going to be able to, I think, move from three to let's say nine for a huge haul, um, Mm -hmm. you know, by, by doing that pivot there. And and as such, I think Lance goes before pick seven as a result of that. Yeah. I think that getting back in front of Detroit, given the fact that Detroit very much could be in the quarterback market makes a lot of sense. If you can get two trade downs in one draft, or I guess, you know, three trades total, why not do it for sure? Miami, a sharp organization. So, uh, definitely would make a lot of sense. That is Dr. Eric Eager. Make sure you follow him at twi- on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. Check out the PFF forecast podcast as well. Eric, good luck uh, with the Justin Fields and every other bet you've got going on. And hopefully we'll talk to you again here soon. Hey, thanks for having me on guys. This was fun. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus for swinging by and breaking down uh, betting on this year's draft. Make sure you check out the PFF Forecast podcast. A link to that is in the show notes over on numberfire.com. And we talked a lot about Mac Jones and Justin Fields. And Ed, we haven't gotten to talk Zach Wilson yet. And I thought that what Eric was saying was fascinating because I actually agree with him on most things with Zach Wilson. I view Zach Wilson and Justin Fields as being like the 2A and 2B in this draft behind Trevor Lawrence. I like Zach Wilson a lot, and I feel like because we've grown so fond of Justin Fields, it's led to a lot of negativity around Zach Wilson. And I'm like, I want to be protective of Zach Wilson. I'm like, yes, we should pump up Justin Fields, but let's not have any you know drive-bys of Zach Wilson in the process. What are your thoughts on Zach Wilson? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, personally, like from what I've seen him play and from other stuff I've read, I'm not particularly high on him mm-hmm. as an NFL quarterback. But honestly, that doesn't matter in this discussion, right? Because right. it's all about where he's actually going to go. And I think that's really important, right? Like what you think a team should pick should have nothing to do with your analysis of, of trying to bet this draft, right? You just just put that away. And despite my uh, relative skepticism about Wilson, like he's going to be the second pick. And at this point, like, I think I saw a minus 3,000 somewhere and was wondering if that's still valuable. You right. know, you can go over to grinding the mocks, and out of the hundreds of mocks that, that Benjamin's collected, there might be two in the last month that don't have him as a second pick. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know what do you think about minus 3,000. I think I saw that yesterday somewhere. Uh, it's not at FanDuel, but, but somewhere else. Well, the implied odds of that are 96.77%. Yeah. And if we're seeing every mock except for two is saying Zach Wilson, that would imply that there is value in minus 3,000. It's minus 5,000 now, uh, the implied odds on that. I can't do it oh, in my head yet. <laughs> it's hmm. 98.04. Um, that's still probably valuable, right? 98.04 implied probability? But that's a lot to lay for... Sure. A very little amount of money, right? So, like, especially because limits are low, like, you know, you're not going to profit a whole lot there. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure he's going to be the second pick, right? I mean, there's, you know, unless he 
<laughs> Unless we get some videos of, of him smoking a joint like the night before <laughs> the draft or something like that. So, yeah, you know, it's something you know, it, it's something that I, I haven't pulled the trigger on yet. Probably yeah. won't, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely going to be it's it's definitely going to be interesting. Uh, I mean, I definitely think, I I do think he goes there, and then all the yeah. drama happens at pick number three. Um, but maybe something to profit on. It makes me feel a lot better about my my being high on Zach Wilson that the the people at Pro Football Focus also like him too. That makes me feel better about myself. It is, uh, you know, confirmation bias, but sometimes I'm okay with that. Let's move into covering the future for today. And Ed, you want to talk about the NFL draft and betting that. Where are you seeing value in the markets right now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think just as a general note, you know, I talked about how Chris Andrews was saying they've never made a dollar putting up markets for the NFL draft, which I, I just, I just think is hilarious. Uh, there, there's a, you can go check it's on Twitter of uh, VEASAN. You can kind of look in, in my profile if you want to find it. But, um, but just kind of as an example of, you know, why you should be betting the NFL draft. Um, you know, there was an article over on PFF that noted how in the market for the first cornerback, Patrick Sertan was kind of opened as the favorite at plus plus one ten, which is about a break even probability of 48%. Uh, right now he's minus 300, so break even probability about 75 percent, and you would never see that kind of market movement on a money line for an NFL game, right? So that just shows you, like, when markets move that much, like, bookmakers are struggling with with those with 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 putting out those numbers, right? And I and I, I and I do think there is value there, and you know these lines move fast. If you like something, you should bet it. Like, don't wait. Um, you know, I'm actually now coming to think about. It. I think I think. Uh, Wilson was minus three thousand at FanDuel yesterday. Yeah, he's five thousand now. So yeah, people... he's five thousand now. So that boom, right. That's gone, right? <laughs> so, um, so anyways, yeah. Let's let's talk about like the tools I use. You know, grinding the mocks is is the tool that that Doctor Eager talked about, and it's Benjamin Robinson who uh, does this hard work of of putting together all these mock drafts, and it uses the wisdom of crowds, right? You know, one mock draft is not going to be is not necessarily perfect by any stretch, but when you put together enough of them. Um, uh, you get a pretty powerful predictor. And so one of the things that uh, his tool likes is Najee Harris. So he's projected to be about the 22nd pick. Um, so I definitely like his under. Uh, I, I got a DraftKings at 30 and a half. Uh, the number was lower at FanDuel. So, and, and one of the things about Benjamin's tool that he's shown is that um, the, total, the total mock draft tool tends to be better for later picks. Um, the expert picks tend to be better for the first uh, the, the the first picks, the first 10 picks in the draft, the way he's done his analysis. So I tend to lean more towards his tool when I'm looking at late first round t- picks or or anything that is in that range. Um, I am working on uh, putting together kind of an experts uh, type wisdom of crowds estimators. This is definitely inspired by Matthew Friedman yeah. last week. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today because that was kind of a frustrating experience this week. Um, so for example, like Lance Zerline of NFL.com hasn't posted a mock draft since uh, March 29th. So I'm going to wait for some of these uh, top experts to, to post more updated information uh, over the next week. And then uh, we'll probably talk about it next week. Okay. I like it. The Najee Harris number at DraftKings is interesting because 30 and a half gets you the bills whereas the FanDuel number does not get you the Bills. And the Bills, I agree with Dr. Eager, where they're a very smart organization, where your prior going in is that they're probably not going to take a first-round running back. But, like, there is a need there. And in theory, if you can get the Bills involved in the under for Najee Harris, I think that makes a lot of sense because the Steelers are 24th. They're in the market for a running back. Uh, So I think that if you can get both the Bills and the Steelers encompassed in there, that's pretty yeah. advantageous. And I think that also goes back to the point where because these markets are a lot less sharp, I guess. I don't know the right way to phrase it, but like they're yeah. a lot less uh, drilled down. Efficient. Yeah. The the value of line shopping is so much higher. Like yeah. uh, Matthew Freeman's been tweeting about a bunch of different like arbitrage uh, possibilities. Yep. Um, and like those aren't available to us most of the situations. So it's not just the fact you can get tremendous closing line value it's also that you can get bad numbers if you're comparing one book to another so 
multiple yeah. reasons to be super in tuned to the NFL draft. Next week is going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it for sure. But before then, we have to have fun this week on Sunday because the NASCAR Cup Series is in Talladega, super high variance track, which means that there are a large handful of teams that can win, which means you have more leeway to bet long shots here if you want to, if you want to look at your than you would at other tracks. I'm looking at a long shot for this weekend, but not as a guy to win. I think that Kaz Rala is a massive, massive value for a top 10 at plus 550. Uh, you can find that at DraftKings right now. The other drivers around Rala are in absolute, like, lemon equipment. Like, on the NASCAR entry list, it lists the year the car was made. These dudes are driving cars that were not made in 2021, whereas Kaz Grala is. We've seen Colleg Racing uh, a couple of times this year. They've been competitive. They're a very good Xfinity Series team. It seems like they have plans to transition to the Cup Series next year. This will be their fourth time racing in the Cup Series, and they've already got a top 10 in that span. Uh, That came this year with A.J. Allmendinger at the Daytona Road Course, and part of that's because Allmendinger is tremendous on road courses, but you're not going to finish top 10 there if you're driving a lemon, and they're not right now. Grala was in this car for the Daytona 500. We saw Justin Haley in it last year at Daytona. He finished 13th. Grala finished 28th at Daytona this year, but he was competitive. He seemed to be running pretty well. He's running 16th when the race got delayed by rain. He was running competitive lap times, and that to me says they have the equipment to get the job done if Grala can run a clean race. And He's done that plenty of times in other series before. He has run three Daytona races in the Xfinity Series and in the Truck Series. He has a win in those three races. Other two are both top five finishes. So the talent's there. He finished ninth in Talladega in a truck last year. Talladega's not a place you can run well if you're in bad equipment. It is more equipment heavy than Daytona is, but... I don't think that Grala is in bad equipment based on what Colleg has done so far, given the funding that they have. And I know that he has a talent based on what he's done in the other series. So getting him at plus 550 to finish top 10 is too good for me to pass up. So I like that one quite a bit. If you're looking for outrights, you want to bet to win uh, Talladega. My model does like Kyle Busch a lot at 16 to 1. He's at 7.6% to win in my simulations compared to 5.9% implied. I think that's the biggest edge uh, from an outright's perspective over there. Other guy the Sims like is Chris Busher, not as big of an edge there. He's a 2.7% implied or 2.7% overall versus 2.0% uh, implied. So those are lower probability ones, but they do present good value. So if you're looking for value, I think that Bush and Busher make a lot of sense in the outright market, but I think if you're looking for a bet that is just mispriced, Kaz Grala is your best route at plus 550 to finish inside the top 10. And Ed, I, I, thinking back to when I was a kid, I remember how much fun these couple of weekends always were. Like There was one weekend in, in the end of April where you had the NFL draft, you had the Kentucky Derby. I'm pretty sure there was a big, like it might have been a Manny Weather uh, fight at some point on a Saturday as well. But, like, this is, for me, as someone who is a NASCAR NFL draft nerd who does enjoy the Kentucky Derby, like, this is one of the best two-week stretches in the sports calendar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I I think everything, you know, my attention gets taken so much by the draft, it's good to talk to you about other things that that are going on during this time. Yeah, and NASCAR, chief among them. Obviously, NFL draft, very secondary to NASCAR at all times, for (laughs) sure. That is all the time that we have for today here on Covering the Spread. Want to give a big thank you one more time to Dr. Eric Eager for swinging by and breaking down the NFL draft. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric if you want a link to the PFF Forecast podcast. Just search for it uh, wherever you get your podcast, but also I do have a link there in the show notes over on numberfire.com. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I've been writing about the NFL draft and uh, my free email newsletter. Uh, you can check that out at thepowerrank.com. There will at least be one more uh, before the start of uh, the NFL draft next Thursday. Oh, also, I wanted to bring up Quarantine Corner uh, yes. one more time. So it's the back. Hemingway documentary uh, by Ken Burns is is awesome. I've been completely enthralled by the entire thing and um, – you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Hemingway. I've, I've read some of his stuff, and it, it's kind of, you know, he's he's like a macho kind of guy. Like, if you like football and you like to bet, you're probably going to like some of his books because that's the kind of that's the kind of dude he was back then. Um, but his life is so much more interesting than I 
knew. So I kind of known that he was he was with, within the first uh, Allied forces that liberated Paris at the end of World War II. Really? So as yeah, as a journalist, he somehow got himself to you know be with the troops that that liberated Paris. And so there's a story about how how Ernest Hemingway liberated Paris. Um, and that was the kind of guy he was. He's like, hey, are people shooting at each other over there? I'm going <laughs> to head that in that direction. Um, but the whole truth about that whole World War II thing is so much more interesting than the fact that he just showed up at Paris when it was liberated. Uh, there's just so much more going on, including a couple concussions and and, and a lot of drama with the, the women that he was with. So the whole thing is is so interesting. Like any little snippet, it's just so well done. Yeah, that any little snippet of it is just a, a fascinating detail about a man who lived a crazy life. So, are you a big documentary guy? I mean, I am. Um, you know, I mean, I definitely love ESPN Thirty for Thirty. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about that when I when I was thinking about talking about this, like uh, the two Escobars and and some of the other ones, uh, the Murnovich Project. Yeah, man, that is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. At least for me personally, I'm not sure if everyone would like it, but in terms yeah. of like father son type bonding uh father son type story uh it was pretty amazing so i do like documentaries i mean i don't like documentaries as much as i like novels sure but um well i was going to bring back if we're bringing back quarantine corner i was going to give a recommendation to you for another documentary to watch all right when you were in boston did you ever go to the isabella stewart gardner museum oh yeah yeah yeah. the the netflix thing about the robbery yeah it was yeah, amazing. Actually, my wife and I were watching part of that. We got it. We got it. We haven't finished it yet. You should finish it. It's worth it. Right. I think it's like three or four episodes, but it's okay. so fun. Um, like, What's it called? Uh, just so everyone knows. Oof. Um, this is a robbery, I believe. I think it's called This is a Robbery. If you search Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, uh, it's like it's a story about the robbery of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, which is a, an awesome museum. Uh, my wife and I went there when we lived in Boston and really cool place. Uh, but I didn't know the story at the time. But what they do is they have these these frames hanging up in the museum of where the art was stolen. Like they just kept the frames up of the stolen art pieces. <laughs> and so I was like, "What? What is this?" And I remember that happening, but I didn't remember the story behind it because I didn't. I know I wasn't paying super right. close attention. Um, but like they have a whole documentary about it. It brings the, the mob into it. Uh, they try to track down where stuff is, and it's pretty fun. So I'd recommend it if you. If you are someone who enjoys documentaries but good stories, they actually talked about that robbery on Drunk History. So I would say do a twofer. You watch the the documentary, then you watch the Drunk History about it, and I think you just kind of double dose on your Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum history there. So that's your next that's, recommendation, Ed. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, that was like the biggest art heist ever. Yeah, like $500 million worth of art yeah. was stolen, I think. So. It was, it was, I'm not a big art person. Like I, I appreciate art, but I'm not, it's not my biggest interest, but the documentary right. was fantastic. So awesome. quarantine corner back uh, here on covering the spread. Make sure you check out Ed on Twitter at the, at the power rank and check out the football analytics show as well. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, we are covering the spread wherever you get your podcast there again, Kentucky Derby podcast coming up for you next week. So make sure you are subscribed. And as always, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel podcast network at FanDuel podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer for running the video side of things here today thank you cal as always and thank you to everyone for tuning in good luck to you with your nfl draft betting we'll talk to you once again next week to get you set for the kentucky derby this has been covering the spread right here on the fan duel podcast network 